All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and welcome to the third installment of the Met Opera's HD Live in Schools Opera Book Club for the 2022-2023 year. This is also, um, we're concluding our discussion of Michael Cunningham's Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Hours, alongside the world premiere staging of Kevin Putz and Greg Pierce's opera based on the novel, which students around the country were finally able to view this past weekend, which is very exciting. Um, and so we're so excited to be joined by students and teachers from HD Live and Schools partner districts across the country and to welcome a very special guest, um, Joyce DiDonato. So thanks so much for being with us today, Joyce. You're welcome, Nick. I'm thrilled to be here. Wow, very excited. So Joyce really needs no introduction, but I'll go through the formality. Um, she's a Grammy and Olivier award-winning artist who has appeared in countless uh, starring roles on the Met stage. Her performance as Virginia Woolf in The Hours has so far been called gripping, uncanny, utterly harrowing, and astonishing, among many other glowing adjectives. And recently, in addition to her turn in The Hours, if that weren't enough, um, Joyce also recently received a Grammy nomination for Best Classical Solo Vocal Album for Eden, which she released earlier this year in February. Um, and I think the Grammys are in January or February. February. Okay, so voting is just open, so you never know. <laughs> okay. If anybody uh, watching has any sway with Grammy voters, please um, make it happen. Uh, and, most, <laughs> and most recently, I would be remiss not to mention um, that Joyce can be heard in the season two finale of White Lotus. Um, at the opening of the episode, her recordings of Thy Hand Belinda and Dido's Lament from Dido and Aeneas, the Henry Purcell opera. Uh, open the episode. and for That might be the most impressive thing of all. <laughs> yeah. And we're not going to do any spoilers because it's still, it's been a few days since the finale came out. But for those of you who know opera, I think that might be a clue as to what happens at the end of the okay. season. And I'll leave it at that. Do you know I've never seen the series? So that might be my holiday binge watching. There you go. And you'll probably be able to guess what happens based on okay. the that song. <laughs> um, so since we have a lot of student questions, I'm going to keep my own questions relatively brief. Um, but first, I just want to sort of check in and ask what it's been like to do the hours, especially since tonight, if I'm not wrong, is the final performance. It's true. Um, it's been a bit of a short run. But with all of the anticipation, the build up, the years of workshopping and doing it in, in different versions through COVID, um, what is it finally like to now be at the end of this run and have it almost in the rearview mirror? It is, um, yeah, there's literally three hours left <laughs> before it finishes. Um, you know, I've done a number of world premieres over the mm -hmm. course of my career, and it's always um, nerve wracking and very much a sense of you have no idea even though it's been in the process of being written in workshop for years before opening night comes and you can have a sense of what it feels like and what you think might work and not, but you never know until the audience arrives, how the piece is actually being received. Mm -hmm. And we only, we've had seven performances so far tonight is our eighth and last of this opening run. And it has been partly a relief, but more importantly, and more thing, it's has been exhilarating to feel it, you know, sold out performances. We had a huge showing in the HD this weekend mm -hmm. in cinemas. And I think even yesterday it was on court around and not just like people saying, Oh, I loved it. Oh, that's a great, we loved it. It was so much fun. It's like people saying, I'm still thinking about it. And this mm -hmm. has changed me and this had impact in my life. And it really, it's what you want, you hope and want all opera and art to do, it's to really, really, really touch the hearts of the listeners or the viewers. And that has been the most rewarding thing about this. It feels like it has had real impact on the lives of the people that encountered it. That's wonderful to hear. It's almost like the question of like, do you like the opera or not is actually not necessarily that interesting or relevant when we're talking about a new work, right? No, that, and that's not what people want to say. They want to say, this is what I felt. This is what I experienced. And this is what I've been thinking about since. And I can't wait to see it again. You know, I predicted that in the, the first day we had the chorus join us in the Zitzprobe. 
they're so busy that that they hadn't joined us for any of the rehearsals. We'd been working for about two and a half weeks at that point. And I told them, I said, you guys aren't ready for what this piece is because they only knew their part of the piece. Mm -hmm. And they, we finished the rehearsal and they were all in tears. I said, I told you so. They said, we, we really weren't ready. And I said, people are going to want to experience this more than once because there are so many layers just on a basic thing on the story. There's so many layers. If you don't know the plot twist that's coming in this, right. you, it's like sixth sense. You want to go back and watch it all again with the filter of what you know is, is happening. Um, but I think also just emotionally people want to follow the different story of each of the characters in a different way. And so to answer your question, it has felt amazing. That's awesome. It's been amazing to watch and to be a part of the Met as this is all happening. Um, the feeling is just kind of electric in the building. It's been cool to be a part of. Yeah. Um, so I want to turn to some student questions. Um, we have several and we're just we're just going to start and see where okay. we go. Um, so this first question is from Izzy in Bangor, Maine. Um, we talked earlier with Greg Pierce about the process of writing the libretto. Do you how much do you work with the book? with the screenplay, with Wolf's writing, multiple sources. So for you preparing this performance, did the hours, the novel, or the hours, the film influence how you were doing Virginia Woolf? Or do you put them aside and, and sort of pave your own way? It's very interesting because I I pride myself on, on really fleshing out the acting side of an opera, mm -hmm. operatic role, not just the musical side. And so I give that a lot of thought but I have a tendency as a performer, as a vocalist and as a performer, is I can be a bit of a chameleon without really knowing that. And so if I watch too much or listen too much, I will start to pick up characterizations or characteristics from another actress or another singer without right. knowing it. So I'm very um, uh, stingy with the amount of, of research in that regard that I do before a role. And I really rely on the score and the text because I'm, I don't know if Greg had the chance to speak to this, but you know, we're not putting Virginia life's story on the stage. It's not a biopic right. of her. It is a day in her life where you're also trying to understand the essence of what she was as a writer. What were the elements she was fighting that led to her suicide? What were the, the, the depressive elements and the manic elements of her life. Mm -hmm. Certainly she probably didn't experience everything in one day, but that's the, the conceit of this as it goes out. And so if I focus too much on the suicide, I'm not there in that first scene working on that, her as a writer, that getting that first sentence on the page, which is right. so imperative. So I, confession time. When I mm -hmm. first saw the film, when it came out 20 some years ago, whenever it arrived, um, I couldn't finish it. Okay. I found it a little too depressing, a little too bleak. And I was like, oh, I don't get it. Fast forward 20 years and I've gotten mm -hmm. a little bit older. I've lived the life of a woman's life here for, you know, through my thirties, forties, starting my fifties. And this summer I said, you know, I'm going to go back and I'm going to revisit the film. And I'm really glad I did early in the process. Um, but then I really put it away. I put the novel away. I didn't um, do a deep, deep dive into Virginia's life. I did a lot of her writing, understand mm -hmm. what she was writing. And then I relied on Kevin and Greg to help bring her to life. Awesome. Yeah, I can imagine if you do too much research, then you're not creating a character. You're just filtering information. And that's not... Correct. You know, dramatically speaking, what audiences are yeah. that interested in, right? And Virginia in the, the opera, The Hours, is a unique creation. Right. And I needed the space to find her. Right. Um, this leads me to our, our next question, which I love, from uh, Jasper in Bangor, Maine, who asks, given the reception, you know, the sort of critical um, appraisal of your role uh, or of your performance, what does it mean to you to be considered an uncanny role for to, to have successfully done this thing? I know it's very weird to look at, to like read reviews yeah. that, that closely, but like, what does that mean to you as an artist to see that you're not like 
creation of a version of Virginia Woolf is successful or seems to be resonant with what the real Virginia Woolf was like, if that makes sense. It does. You know, I I put a lot of that mm. on the feet of, of Greg and Kevin. I mean, mm -hmm. I think they wisely didn't shy away from her wit and her humor. Um, I think the way they set the stage from the very beginning, we see that she's having a hard time getting out of bed. Right. We see it's hard for her to start the day. And we see that absolute terror and exhilaration at her need and desire to start writing. The obsession of it, the mania of it, the despondency of it. I mean, all of that is there. And I that made my job very easy. The way I actually, how does it feel to be considered that? I take it as a big compliment because I've had a number of people that know me pretty well say, we forgot it was you on this stage. Mm -hmm. Like you sort of disappear. And I, I can't say that I share a whole lot of traits <laughs> with Virginia. Yeah. As, as I understand her, you know, I, um, I'm not really prone to despondency too much. I, I quote Donna Leone, another good friend of mine, a writer, and she's like, Joyce, I don't know what to say. I was born with the happiness gene. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's sort of my, not that every day is a cakewalk for me, but I work really hard at humor and buoyancy and positivity in life. And so there's a lot about her life that, that doesn't resonate directly with me and how I experience life. I can recognize it in other people. I can recognize tendencies to that in myself. But it's a it's I've surprised myself how much I have loved playing her. Mm -hmm. And again, this is Kevin and Greg because she feels so three-dimensional the way they've written her. And the arc of her striving to get through that structure of what Mrs. Dalloway will be while navigating her own insecurities and fears and and tendencies. It is so rich. Um, and so if I disappeared on the stage and became yeah. uncannily like Virginia Woolf, that's good. There are a few people at the stage door going, why did they have to make you look so dumpy or so uh, uh, drab and all of this? And I'm like, I know you think you're giving me a compliment, but you don't have to go that far. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, you know, again, it's not trying to put a carbon copy of Virginia on, on the stage, but right. to give that stifling, humid, uh, coffin-like existence that is part of the story of Starting the Hours. And I love being in that costume. And I love that people aren't seeing, you know, Joyce DiDonato up there. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I say job done. <laughs> so this actually uh, connects with a question we have from uh, some of our students in the Bronx at Celia Cruz High School, a longtime uh, partner with our HD Live in Schools program. So Abigail and Kimani ask, how did you prepare mentally to take on the role of Virginia Woolf, right? When all of the, you have the costume, the jewelry, the hair, that all helps. But especially yeah. if your disposition, as you're saying, is sunnier, and you're getting prepared to play someone who is a much more maybe melancholy disposition. What do you have to do to sort of prepare mentally for that well, kind of work? This is why I love what I do is I get to disappear and I get to really inhabit somebody that is not at all like me. The last thing I did on the stage of the Met was Agrippina, which was a mm -hmm. conniving, murderous, terrible mother, um, just just on the edge of everything that's wrong with humanity, you know, and I loved playing her, you know, and I was in a pencil skirt and stilettos and a black beehive thing, right. drinking martinis all day out of the bottle, you know, um, very different from Virginia. And so I think really to go to your question, I think my preparation has been my whole career mm. about how can I, I mean, it's easy, for example, if I was playing Cinderella or Rosina, some of the, the roles that I did earlier in my career that are youthful and fun, positive and like can do characters like we can make this happen. I, I find a lot of myself in those kind of characters. And so people would still see Joyce in those. Mm -hmm. And as I've gotten a bit older and I've taken on slightly more complex uh, meteor characters in a way that people don't necessarily associate me with. 
I'm still doing the same kind of work I did earlier. I'm just going all in yeah. uh, with those characters. And I love the fact that people forget that they're watching me. The other thing I might say is mm -hmm. um, this is if, you know, Abigail and Kimani, if you guys mm -hmm. are thinking of going into theater at all, some of the best advice I ever got was from a director, Leonard Folia. He did a lot of plays on Broadway and he directed me in a piece um, called Dead Man Walking that might be coming to the Met next year. And that that's a real life. So we heard <laughs> um, that's another great one to study. There's a fantastic book that started yep. the whole journey by Sister Helen Prejean, who's a nun from the South. Um, and, you know, she's on my mind a lot as I go on to this role. The director, Leonard Folia, said, you know, Joyce, we were doing Dead Man Walking together. And he said, there's only two things that exist on the stage, that which is true and that which is false. And it doesn't mean that me as Joyce, that I'm feeling everything that Virginia feels for myself. What it means is what I'm portraying is complete truth in that moment. So I, everything that's coming out of my mouth has to be spoken and sung in that way. It has to be so pertinent when I'm making eye, to eye contact with somebody and then I'm going into my head, that journey from talking to Leonard, and then I hear the voices, the flowers, the flowers. I hear that and I'm there. So it's total commitment to the truth of, of whatever moment I'm playing. That's interesting. That is the truth of what you're doing, but not necessarily say the historical truth of what it represents, right? It's not like, what would Virginia Woolf do? It's more like, what does this character do in this moment? Correct. Who is based on Virginia Woolf. We kept talking right. in the rehearsal process about the essence of these characters. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for example, with that, I find it in the body language. I love to use my sweater to sort of uh, try and, if, she, if Virginia is in a moment where she's hearing the voices or is being pulled to the river, pulled to the thoughts of suicide, you know, sometimes the hands in the pocket and trying to find a way to come back to the present moment, to the writing mm -hmm. or to the conversation. I used the costume. Um, when I put that wig on my head, I mean, I don't see Joyce anymore. I see yeah. what looks like our, our understanding of Virginia. And so all of those things also help. But ultimately, I have to be completely clear about the gear shifts and the, the shifts that I'm making here. I love your questions so far, guys. And I want to hear how your reactions were to watching it on HD, but maybe that's for another time. Um, I have another question from Alyssa and Ysaira in the Bronx, which is similar to what we just touched on, but it's sort of the opposite end. How do you persevere through the darkness of the character? How do you get to the other end when the show is done, when you take off the costume? Does what you've just done for the, those two, three hours linger with you and what do you do with that? Do you need to shed it or do you let it sort of stay with you? It It's the real challenge for me with a character like this is during the rehearsal process mm -hmm. because it's really important for me to allow Joyce because these emotions that come through the music and the text and the character, they have to come through my apparatus. They have to come through me. And this is also very true with Sister Helen, very much in the, the next character I'll do. Um, in the, if I don't allow that, the, the truth of the character to really flow through my heart, my mind, my emotions in the rehearsal process, the chances are they'll take me by surprise in the performance. And if I haven't figured out how to keep the tears from coming or to lose my concentration, et cetera, um, or to just really have to stop because it's too much, um, I need that to happen in the rehearsal space because the people that are coming to see the show, to be quite blunt, you've paid money to actually right. see the show and not see Joyce suffer through doing the character of Virginia. That's really right. important. But in order for me to get to that point, I have to face all the things that it's arising and bringing up for me as a, as a performer, as a person. And, you know, there's that moment where it's conjured up for the opera um, because the, the novel and the film, they actually start with seeing the suicide of Virginia. She's in the water. Right. right. 
and that they chose not to to start it that way or even really go that far in the opera but there is the moment where she asks Nelly Nelly could you imagine a, a scenario where a woman would put stones in her pocket and disappear and not tell anybody and then the dancers come on and there's this music where we where she's envisioning it or it's foreshadowing it, it could be interpreted a couple different ways the first time we did that it was just i was in tears because the music is so evocative you feel the presence of the dancers coming up behind with this this movement where they go up on their toes and down so it's almost like they're waves in the water mm -hmm. and it's so beautiful and it's so sad and i can't help but not imagine what Virginia was feeling right as she went into the water. And also she tried to attempt to, to take her life a few times even before she was successful. Right. And all of that is present in her story. And I needed to um, feel that as Joyce in the rehearsal space and to let the tears come and to not sing and to stop because then um, when it comes time to the performance, I can't afford for that to happen, but it needs to be present. I don't need to have been suicidal, but I need to have been in touch with the emotional journey that Virginia is making in that moment. I have to have access to that as a character, not literally. Um, that's very important, especially when it is uh, this topic. I right. don't literally have to have examined that or put myself through that emotionally, but I know what despair is. I know what depression feels like, not clinical depression. I'm very fortunate, but I certainly have experienced moments like that. And right. so this is a moment that I can be in touch with that and ultimately be open so that the, music's emotion and the emotion of the character he's just going through me so that the audience receives it without too much um interference on my part that's so interesting because i think we usually think about rehearsal or practice as the space where you're trying to get it right so that it's good on stage but it might be that rehearsal is also a place where you can do things that you wouldn't otherwise do in performance like you can take it too far you can mess it up in a way and that is actually what helps you perfect it on stage rather than just getting it up to a certain level i'm so glad you said that nick that's really important for any of you that are performers is the most productive thing that will ever happen to you is to make mistakes and to go too far in the rehearsal process that is where the learning curve really takes off if you do it correctly all the time, mm -hmm. it's kind of like you, okay, you're there, you got it, you got it, you got it. There's no growth. There's no, right. there's no friction to like break through something or to like, now I have that tsunami in me. I know how to stand there and deliver it now because it's already traveled through me. Um, and with pieces like this that are so true and so deeply rooted to real emotion, it's important that we have access to that. That comes through searching in the rehearsal. Yeah. So one of our next questions is from a different Alyssa, Alyssa E in the Bronx, who asks, "Do you have a favorite scene in the hours?" And I'm I'm really curious to hear about this. I love it all, <laughs> and if you take out one scene for Virginia, mm -hmm. ooh, it lessens. I love, I love her opening music. I love where we've got Washington Square and there's Renee Fleming and, you know, all the excitement, the buzz, and there's a ton of chorus. And then the door to Virginia's study opens and I walk through and all you hear is the piano. The piano, yeah, it's beautiful. I love that moment because I think Kevin was really bold in, in using the nostalgia that we feel when we hear a big orchestra and then like a solo piano kind of quiet and simple. Um, and it's just me, I don't have to sing yet, but we feel the lethargy and the difficulty of Virginia just to get going. 
in the day. I think it's captured yeah. so perfectly. And it's that juxtaposition against the the Clarissa, I've got to buy the flowers and I go to Washington Square and if I'm planning a party, let's go. And then boom, right next door, there's somebody who's having a very different experience of that same day. You guys, I'm sure you see that in school, right? You come to school, you're having a great day and you see somebody across the, the hallway, probably somebody you don't know very well and you just know that they are not in a good place. And those two things are existing side by side at the same time. I think it's pretty brilliant. I love the scene with the bird. The I love the, the scene bird. Yeah. The, because I think these kids are amazing and they are unbelievable actors, much more so than some of the operatic colleagues that I sometimes <laughs> see where they're really listening and they're really responding. And I, I, we, we do some games backstage right before we go on stage. So I have a lot of fun being with them. Then there's also the moment of the dinner table. At, well, see, I love them all. The mm -hmm. dinner table at the end when, it's, at this point, it's been a long day for Virginia, and she's nearly lost it with Leonard at the edge of the river, and then she really loses it with the kids. And she knows it. Mm -hmm. She knows it. It's it's. She even says at the end to Leonard, it's like, it's back. Like, I know that this illness is back. So she's aware of it and she's still trying to go on with normality. And, you know, she's trying to eat, but she can't. But she takes that moment to say to Leonard, you've given me everything I could have asked for and everything that was possible. Right. That's uh, every possible happiness, happiness right. he gave her. And, and so that's also, but you know, I don't get to that point in the opera without all the other scenes in front. And that's why I think it's a really extraordinary piece because there's not much to take out the, the it suffers. We've got a lot of sirens here. Sorry. I don't know if you hear that. No, that's all right. It's, it's New York. It's, it's local York flavor. Um, yeah, I love that you mentioned the piano that comes in. When I, I first heard that during the first orchestra rehearsals, I snuck in and could hear some of it and it's been in my head for a week. And it yeah. does, it sounds like someone who's trying to get up and get, get on with their day, but is kind of slipping, you know, trying yeah. to put on a face, um, trying to be chipper, but is actually not quite making it up that hill. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's rare you hear just a plain piano in an orchestral or operatic setting. So yeah. um, I love that you mentioned that. Um, so one thing we've talked about the last couple of weeks, this is our last question from students, this one is, also from Maine, um, deals with questions of gender. Um, and this is uh, obviously the hours is really centered on women characters, um, but also deals quite explicitly with queer love, with queer relationships. Um, and you've also in the past done trouser roles, right? Which mm -hmm. um, students may or may not know are roles that are men, characters that are men, but are usually sung by women, often mezzo-sopranos. Usually young men, like te usually young teenage, men. Okay. teenage kids, but where the voice hasn't necessarily completely changed yet. Right. Um, so Madeline from Bangor wants to know, do you have a preference playing male or female roles? And is there a difference? Yeah, there is a, well, yes and no. I mean, my whole thing as a as an actor is really how do I just make that character as vivid, three-dimensional, real, and true as possible. Mm -hmm. And it's oh, so interesting because I, I don't intentionally, if I'm playing a pants role, I don't intentionally mm -hmm. go in like, I have to be a guy now. Right. I just, I become Isolier or Sesto. Um, but that here, here's a very interesting difference. In the operatic world, usually those pants rolls have the most growth throughout an opera. Interesting. A lot of times, like the soprano or the, the one who's dying is very loving at the beginning, gets sick, and is very loving at the end and being very sacrificial by the end of the show. Or um, uh, the princess it has a struggle. She doesn't quite know how to get out of her situation, but mm -hmm. she's just as smart and happy at the end as she is at the beginning. 
the pants rolls are like at the beginning they're like i don't know how to do anything and then all mm -hmm. of a sudden the opera comes and by the end they're like the most loving noble knight at the yeah. end of the opera you know because again they're sort of teenagers and and so their projectory is quite big i sing romeo in uh, a opera capuletti montecchi the Capulets and the Montagues by Bellini. Yeah. And at the beginning, Romeo is like, I can stop the war. I can do anything. And he goes into this room of men. And, and it strikes me every time I do that. It's like, oh, like I'm allowed to enter this room where it's all men and I have my sword and they have to listen to me for 12 minutes sing. You know, that doesn't always happen to the woman character. The woman right. often has her big scene in the privacy of her own bedroom where nobody else is listening. You know, I love how empowering that is. I love it. One thing that I think is really bold and interesting about the hours and, you know, I read comments. I don't, I'm not crazy obsessed about them, but I do read and there have been a couple people that were like, why didn't they make more out of the queer storylines or the lesbian element of this? And I actually, I don't have the answer to that. I didn't write the piece. Right. But what I love is that it's just there. It's mm -hmm. just who they are. You know, I mean, Richard is dying of AIDS, but it's not all about him saying, I'm a gay man and da, 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 da. It's like, I'm a man who's dying of AIDS. And that was my lover. And, and that was, you know, I mean, the, the film, the, the scene between Laura and Kitty, it's devastating because mm -hmm. so much is said without it being said. Right. And, and then she has to go on about her life. Like, you know, it, I, I just find it interesting. That's not a whole element in the Virginia character. But of course, you know, anybody that, you know, knows Virginia's life and, and career, it's just there. She also didn't make a big thing out of it. She just lived her life right. in an extraordinary moment, an extraordinary time. And she lived it amongst the people that she felt she wanted to live it with. And so I think there is a power to it that it's not announcing an overtly X, Y, or Z or LGBT, whatever, I'm not, but it's not overtly this. This is just who they are. And this right. is their story, which is just as legitimate as whether it's Don Giovanni or the Countess or whatever. It's just who right. they are. Right. And, and I, I, I mean, I'm saying this as a straight woman um, mm -hmm. that, you know, I mean, I, I walk my own path in life. But so from my point of view, I find it very empowering that, these stories are being told with total legitimacy and without having to explain more about who they are. It is just Clarissa and Sally are in love right. and they're having a difficult time in their relationship right now. Right. So I kind of love also, that. Moment. Yeah. I also love that Virginia Woolf, both in her life and in the hours is what we see as a sort of reversal of a typical or stereotypical, um, kind of marriage where you might have a woman who's the caretaker and the man who's the intellectual genius and she brings him food so he can write his books. That's like the stereotype we have of, of what writers and intellectuals are and have been. And historically there's some truth to that. Um, yeah. And in this role, she's the mind and he's the one making sure she has lunch. Um, mm -hmm. He's the one that is taking care of her. So it's a kind of flip of what we usually see in that kind of dynamic. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a, obviously a female role, but it's also, it takes on a different kind of. And dynamic. it's just, it's just presented the way it was. Mm -hmm. It's not like Leonard had, then has a whole scene about, oh, I'm inadequate right. as a man right. or, no, you know, whatever. It, it, he's more it's than just, happy to play that role. It's their story. Yeah. It's complicated, but it's their story. And, right. and I, I find that very empowering. Um, yeah, I find that I, I find it beautiful because the emphasis becomes really about the inner life of these women, including everything that they are or were. Mm -hmm. um, and here's my favorite part about it is that usually we have these great titanic women who are sacrificial, you know, Violetta or Chocho San or 
Mimi. And it, the opera has to end with the tenor going, butterfly. I mean, he's the biggest jerk in the entire operatic canon. And he gets the last line in this amazing right. opera. And there's no tenor at the end going, Virginia or Clarissa. Mm -hmm. It's like we get to it's tell three women. these complicated stories mm -hmm. without a filter. And I, I love that. And that doesn't mean I want to take the butterfly away from the end, but it just means like we're this, this is 2022 and we get to tell this story. And, mm -hmm. um, it feels good. I feel like that's a great note to end on. Um, but can you. I hear, is there any way to get feedback of what people thought of watching the HD? Not live, but we can collect. Okay. Um, we we have we hear hearsay in the education department from what students um, have thought, and we attend some of the screenings with them so we can see in the theater what's going on. Um, yeah. So there's been lots of response, um, and we'll connect with you um, after this is over about um, getting some more feedback from students. But I would love to hear their reactions. Um, I, I know. I bet a lot some, of people would love to hear. Yes, and some scenes I think especially um some kisses some embraces that got some reactions out of students so um thank you so much again for joining us You're um welcome. good luck on the finale of You're the hours tonight us. we're sorry to see it go um and for uh, those of you who are watching live thanks for joining us joining us for those of you who are watching on youtube um thank you for watching um and we'll see you in the spring when we do uh, man in the ring for champion. Um, but oh, yeah. cool, very cool. Yes, but uh, this concludes our opera book club for the hours. So thanks so much, Joyce. Thank you guys. Thanks for the hours. <laughs> Bye.